If you haven't seen the previous video in this series, follow the link on your screen or click the link in the description or pinned comment below. DC Comics. I agree. In fact, from now on, I'm just going to remove a sin whenever you say it. Is the Joker just standing here on the street corner in his hideous Joker makeup in public? Or does he put that shit on sometime during the heist? I'm pretty sure he's already wearing that makeup, especially considering how time-constrained this heist is. Besides, he's not yet been introduced to the public, so even if people see his makeup, no one would care, outside of old Asian ladies. You know, because they're afraid of people that look different. <laughs> This guy totally ducks, but the other guy still shoots where his head would have been if he hadn't ducked. Nah, that's simply a matter of perspective. If you tilt a camera at a specific angle, you can make anything look shoulder height, like Robert Downey Jr. and Tom Cruise when they're not wearing heels. The bus behind the Joker's bus did not notice the additional bus breaking the line and coming out of the huge gaping hole in the bank. I wonder what version of the movie you saw where we're shown the perspective of the buses following Joker's bus, and how you know they didn't notice his bus. I mean, what do you expect them to do in this situation exactly? Why does Batman keep meeting with Gordon on a rooftop so low that half the skyscrapers in town can see and photograph the meetings? What is the point of this question? What benefit would someone gain by photographing Batman and Gordon? A memento, perhaps? You pose this question as if the police don't know about their relationship when in the scene you're showing, you see a corrupt cop ask Gordon about Batman specifically. Where is the tumbler busting in from? They're like eight levels up in a parking garage. I'm just going to read from the wiki here, but... Vector controlled jet engine on back of car for quick boosts and rampless jumps. How the f*** is Batman supposed to have gotten into the vault without being seen? Is there a back door? CinemaSins asks how a literal comic book ninja, who had an entire previous film dedicated to his stealth training, does something stealthily. Somewhere out there is a company making money selling useless frosted glass divider panels that don't provide security or actual room division. Is that a sin for the movie or a sin for that company? It seems more like a nitpick on that company and not something wrong with the Dark Knight. This witness manages to get a gun into court in a major organized crime case and is also apparently just holding that in his lap in full view of the judge. The film makes mention of this with a small quip by Rachel in the following scene where she states Gotham City District Attorneys are always being shot at. The point the filmmakers were trying to make was that in this fictional city that is overwhelmed with crime and corrupt cops and officials, even something as crazy as that is normal to them. You have to stop watching movies and trying to place them in our reality and accept the reality presented in the fiction. We're watching a series where a dude dresses as a bat, has infinite money, cannot be killed even by a bomb Oppenheimer would be proud of in The Dark Knight Rises, but draw the line at a gun in a courtroom. All I'm saying is I don't think your priorities are straight. You're not getting shot at. You're not doing your job right. Rachel's all turned on by people trying to kill Harvey Dent, but wouldn't go out with Batman because of the same shit. That's a decent point, but the difference is Batman is not only doing it illegally, he's actively hunting criminals, seeking physical conflict and putting his body in harm's way. But I think it's interesting you make mention of the previous movie, yet we're shocked at Batman being able to stealthily enter the bank vault earlier. There are no cameras in this room, but Lau can see everything anyway. Which obviously means there are cameras in this room that you can't see because they aren't important for the audience to see. Dutiful Guard shrugs off the fact that Lucius has a cell phone that should have been confiscated and then shrugs off the fact that he thinks all black people look alike. To your first point, if the damage was done, there's nothing he could do about it. Can't rewind time. This is a Batman movie, not a Flash movie. Those two won't ever appear on screen together because Nolan is such a stickler for realism. As for your second point, it's obvious you have never been to Asia. Yes, they think all black people look alike. Haven't you seen Rush Hour 2? They call Chris Tucker Kobe Bryant. Sonar. Just like a uh, submarine. I was going to say bat. Did you just answer Lucius Fox as a sin? Did, did you speak to the character in the movie? Like he can hear you? Communist China apparently has no rules about the airspace over Hong Kong, and any old smuggler plane can fly within 50 feet of building. Besides the fact that wasn't anywhere near 50 feet, I'm not really sure what the communist bit had to do with anything. I don't think any country would allow a random plane to fly so close to buildings. Other than the US, of course. The Joker card had traces of your DNA on it. Was it semen? I bet it was semen. Wait, am I tripping or is Jeremy speaking to the characters in the film? He's done it once. Why does it keep happening? 
Look, I know he's Batman and everything, but he managed to make it past everyone, including the Joker's henchmen, without anyone seeing him. Wait, you think it's impossible for one guy to show up and not be noticed at a party with loud music and a scrum happening on the dance floor? And I like the caveat you threw in there. I know he's Batman and everything. That's like the entire point of Bla uh, Batman. I guess having four screens of the same Joker broadcast somehow helps Batman. I know this is the realistic Batman and all that. Thanks, Nolan. But being incredibly obsessive is a core tenet of Batman's characterization. Having multiple screens of the same broadcast might seem excessive for you, but for Batman, it's just how he deals with his insomnia. Bruce Wayne has the technology to reconstruct fingerprints from a shattered bullet that went through a brick, so why hasn't he also invented time travel or a woman who has orgasms? Well, he hasn't yet met the Flash, so he doesn't know time travel is possible. I've always thought that Keaton's Batman was the one who'd be most receptive to interstellar and time travel shenanigans, but alas, it's 2013 and he's too old for this Batman sh Also, women always seem to orgasm around me. Must be a skill issue. The Joker's named you next. Harvey has known Rachel is next since the daytime shooting, but waits until nighttime to tell her about it. You also failed to mention the part of the movie that showed Harvey slips into his future Two-Face persona during Loeb's funeral. Once he saw Rachel's name on the assassin's uniform, he got extremely angry, preventing him from thinking about anything else in that moment. Harvey Dent drove to this random spot to question this crazy guy, and Batman's been busy beating up Maroney, so how does he know where Dent is? I'm only curious, but what happens if your question is answered? Is the sin rescinded? Would you call the explanation convenient like you always do? I could of course explain that since this is a Batman story, it can be surmised that Bruce is keeping tabs on important people, and that includes Dent. It wouldn't surprise me if Bruce placed a tracker on Dent's phone. All of that is plausible in this universe, and given what we already know about this comic book character. But really, the movie doesn't need to answer this question because it isn't an important plot point. Batman keeping tabs on people he's gotten close to is in every single Batman continuity and has been since his inception. His name's Schiff Thomas. When did Batman have a chance to find out who this crazy dude really was, since he was whisked away before anyone could question him? This is basically the same question as the previous one, only this one is worse because Batman tells you exactly how he knows this guy in the scene. He explicitly says he's a former patient at Arkham. Considering Batman begins to routinely place criminals in that facility, Batman totally knows every single person in Arkham. And no, don't ask when was this established in the Nolan universe, because A, this is them establishing it, and B, you bring up out-of-universe things all the time. Everyone knows Batman studies Arkham like a dude checking the lip of a prostitute he's about to pay. Are you sure you want Rachel, Bruce? She doesn't even look like she did in the first movie. I almost removed a sin for pointing out how they downgraded Rachel in this film, but then I realized you're speaking to the film characters and treating that conversation as a sin of the film. I really gotta come up with a cliche for that. Do they really need to go down to Lower Fifth? Surely there are plenty of other ways to get to their destination. Sure, but as you can see in the footage you're showing, they're simply following the path of least resistance while continuing to move forward. You're speaking as if the characters in the film have knowledge of this being what Joker wanted them to do, and I assure you, if they knew what you know, they wouldn't have. How does the Joker know exactly which route the cops will take so that he's able to set up this helicopter trap? Maybe he doesn't. He probably has guys in multiple locations, but narrowed to the places they funneled the SWAT team. Gordon faked his death to protect his family, but how does he keep that a secret when there are so many corrupt cops on the payroll? He even manages to get on the SWAT team without anyone tipping off the Joker. And what did they tell his wife? Sorry, your husband has been shot, but you can't see the body because his face is so disfigured he looks like Gary Oldman? What's your point exactly? You said a lot of seemingly connected things, but they're all incongruous. For example, what does someone tipping off the Joker have to do with him faking his death? Again, that seems like it makes sense, but then I'd ask, who would have tipped off the Joker? Because the person that helped Gordon obviously wouldn't have tipped off the Joker. And if that's the case, that means your point about there being corrupt cops is nullified too. Hell, they would have also been tricked. Gordon obviously has someone he can trust, and just having that person he could trust completely answers everything you asked. And even if there was someone that could have tipped off the Joker, that would neatly fit into the plot anyway because Joker planned to get arrested, remember? You do like to play things pretty close to the chest. Wait, he never said that. That was Bruce that said that to Fox. So I'm playing this one pretty close to the chest. So you weren't even there. The film is not saying Bruce said this to either of these characters. This is simply a symptom of the writing team having a phrase they liked, so it got repeated in the script. It's similar to people with a very limited vocabulary, so you hear them say a certain thing all the time. Like me, with the word literally. So you're gonna have to play my little game you want to save one of them. Isn't this just the decision the Riddler made Batman make in Batman Forever only on a larger scale? 
Forcing a hero to make a difficult choice between two or more objectives is an extremely common trope in comic books and their adaptations. You might as well send Batman for wearing a costume. Talk me through what's going on with you. Fucking relationships, man. Jeez. Apathy. Joker's plan to break Lau out of prison requires him to be able to get rid of Batman and Gordon so that he can make a phone call and blow this dude and this prison up. There's simply no way the Joker could have known precisely when police would realize Dent was gone, when they would interrogate him about it, when Batman would join the questioning, and when things would escalate to a beating, meaning there's no way he could have had timers on the bombs for Rachel and Harvey that would be timed so perfectly for Batman just in that moment to have only enough time to rescue one of them. Joker is not working alone. A large majority of the things you believe aren't realistic can simply be explained away with his henchmen. All Joker has to do is get in front of Batman, antagonize him, and trick him into going to the location he wants him to go. Those timers were clearly set up by henchmen who would have set them at a set time, and as Joker's plan is to kill one or both of them, the timer is completely immaterial to that goal. We know Joker's plan is for at least one of them to die because that's why he split them up, forcing him to choose. Knowing Joker, he would have been entirely fine if both buildings were on fire when bats showed up. We are seeing Bruce getting lucky he was able to save one person. Batman doesn't even know Rachel had this coin on her when she died, but somehow finds it in the rubble. Or he noticed an extremely large coin, perhaps with light from the fire reflecting off of it, that he took from Dent earlier? No. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the film cliche. That's my turn. Two-Face decides people's fates by the flip of a coin, so wouldn't it make sense that he goes last between Batman, Gordon's son, and himself? No, he's being truly fair. That is the prestige of a character with true morality and what makes Two-Face as compelling a character he is. You see that he is willing to put his own life on the line for what he believes, and that's what Bruce liked about him. Come on, if this were any other third-rate villain, Batman would be able to get out of this. But it's not a third-rate villain. It's the Joker, Batman's favorite human being. Besides the fact that the Joker has been depicted multiple times as being a capable hand-to-hand -hand combatant, I wouldn't be surprised if Bruce's dick was hard in this position. Show starts in eight minutes. Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack. Wow, that's really cool how that stone lets us peer into other timelines. So that was you when you first started? Jim. And it's actually the other guy. The previous future Birdman. He was pretty cool. You would have liked him. The way you speak about him is very confusing. Are we all technically the same person? Clearly not. I notice we're all slightly different. We're only voiced by the same person. What? What the heck does that mean? Hmm. Seems I'm still the only one that realizes we only exist in these videos. I guess that makes me special, Birdman. Well, you sound special, Ed. Anyway, I'm up. Let's get to my version. To satisfy your hunger, your thirst, your sweet tooth. So visit our refreshment center now. Let's go! This was supposed to be the very first logo sin we ever did, but we cut it because we wanted to make videos under five minutes or some shit. Anyway, the origin of this sin is that Chris was a projectionist when this movie came out, and he interlocked two prints through seven projectors on opening night, and he wanted to make sure the sound was good in each auditorium, which meant he had to sit through these logos, all 50 seconds of them, including a silent bat logo, seven goddamn times back on July 18th, 2008 at midnight. And, oh yeah, he ran Mamma Mia that night. Two people showed up. Good for them. Oh no, Chris had to sit through 5.83333333333 minutes of logos. The horror. What you're saying is, this sin exists because a projectionist had to do his job. You know how long I have to sit here and edit these videos? 7 to 10 hours per video, and they average only 12 to 20 minutes. And that's just the editing, which doesn't include the time doing research and writing these scripts, performing the voiceover, or the thumbnail creation process. But guess what? Just like Chris's employer, these videos pay me. So the sin here is biting the hand that fed you. Also, Discovery. Eh, Warner Brothers Discovery is a different company that only came out in the last year. This movie is 15 years old, which is old enough to bang your cousin in Alabama, but not old enough for your sister. They have standards. Also, also, DC Comics. Where did you learn to count? Hey, I know you're a bad guy who blames others for your problems, but didn't you just ask... He's out, right? I mean, you thought he was out too. You were just looking for confirmation from a guy you've barely met. Yeah, he thought he was out, but was unsure, which is why he asked Joker the question. Is this seriously that difficult to understand? Also, Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. Hey. 
This guy ducks all the way to the floor, but the other robber shoots at shoulder level anyway. Wait, wait, wait. I thought this was a re-sin, where you redo the sins and not entirely repeat them to pad the runtime and sin count of this video, bro. We just heard a younger alternate timeline version of me sin that same exact sin. The only reason I'm pointing this out is because there were a few sins you didn't include, like the face paint thing, which confuses the audience on the purpose of this video. Are you redoing or repeating? Because that's the literal difference between a remaster and a remaster. Make. What bus driver? Luckily, the bus driver comes crashing through at this very moment and saves Joker from dying in his own double crossing heist. It's almost like if that happened, there wouldn't be a movie to tell that includes the Joker. Get it? Luckily, your plane landed safely in California that time you traveled here, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to make this silly video, right? Get it? Okay, laugh all you want at these two fake Batmans, but at least they have the wherewithal and know where a major drug deal is going down and are trying to stop it. I mean, what did you do when this was happening? That's right. Nothing. I don't think we laughed at these guys. We totally understood them and why a group of guys fed up with all the crime in Gotham City would take up arms and try to learn from Batman's example. It's kind of a theme in this film, that Batman can't always be the only one to protect this city from itself. That's why Bruce looked at Harvey as his replacement. Some of the marked bills I gave you. My detectives have been making drug buys with them for weeks. The spank was another drop from the mob that makes five. So how did you find out about the other four? This place got robbed and just happened to have marked bills left behind that you could scan. Furthermore, why did it take until this bank got robbed for you to find out there were marked bills here? William Fickner thought people should know this is a mob bank just by looking at it. The bills are marked with a radioactive contaminant, which is something they'd be able to detect through relatively simple means. That's the purpose of them showing Batman using the device on the bills to show the audience the method in which the bills were marked. It would be a simple matter of entering a bank, and if your device detects a larger than normal amount of radiation or a specific wavelength of radiation, then voila, this bank houses your marked bills. Since they have only been used for drug buys and the mob would be the only organization selling those drugs, wherever the money got deposited would be their drop. Do you trust him? It'd be hard to keep him out, and here is this. Stubborn as you are. If Batman really could do this, we should also be seeing it during times where it matters. Here, he's just being a dick for no reason. Where would this ever matter in a situation we need to see? The point is that he can disappear, and if he can do this with his friends, then we understand he can do this with his foes. You don't understand what establishing abilities means. They show you he can do this at times where it doesn't matter, so that if he does it in times it does matter, you won't be confused at what happened. This is what made the scene in The Dark Knight Rises so effective, that when Batman attempted to use darkness against Bane and Bane completely nullified it, you realized how badass Bane truly was. Bruce made Alfred go through the trouble of this whole ass breakfast for no reason, just because he couldn't be bothered to communicate. And here's the confusing bit. In the last video, you pointed out the glass, but here you completely ignore it. What's the rhyme or reason for sending the same thing twice and then completely skipping the other ones? What the hell was the purpose of this video? Money! Batman has no limits. I guess you mean the mythos of Batman, but even then you're wrong. People know he can't shoot lasers out of his eyes. Do they, though? Do they? Sorry I'm late, folks. This is like the preemptive you're late. Is he late for a reason? No. Does his lateness cause any issues? No. It's just another example of Hollywood having characters be late, and or chided for being late just to pad the runtime. Besides the issue of making everyone wait for him, thereby delaying the trial for no reason? And I love the accusation of padding the runtime when you redid a four minute video and made it 29 fucking minutes. You are the Christopher Reeve of film criticism. No legs to stand on. Lightly irradiated bills. Fancy stuff for a city cop. Are you high? Gotham is home to some 30 million people. That's one of the largest cities in the world. Their police department should have the funds for and access to all the latest crime-fighting technologies. What? In what universe does a large city mean the cops have access to radiation with which they would use to irradiate bills to catch money drops for the mafia? This was an ingenious tactic devised by Batman, one of the most brilliant minds in this universe. It had nothing to do with money and all to do with ingenuity. You gonna count me in? Yeah, this town, the fewer people know something, the safer the operation. Yeah, but it's going to require all the SWAT teams in the area to know about it anyway. So what's the difference if Harvey knows? The SWAT teams are simultaneously the minimum and maximum amount of people that Gordon needs for this task. You are failing to understand that Gordon, a detective in one of the most corrupt cities on the planet, is speaking to the only person that could potentially stand in the way of convicting criminals, yes? If the DA is corrupt, the police force is entirely irrelevant. Wayne Tower looks different as f that's probably because those are two different buildings. Look at this shot from Batman Begins. Do you notice anything about the building to the left? Go on, take your time. I'll leave it up for a bit. Gotham City is proud of an ordinary citizen standing up for what's right. Gordon just said in the previous scene that the official policy was to arrest Batman on sight. 
And now here's the city's DA telling a Russian ballerina that he's proud of Batman. And I'm not saying he's wrong, but I am saying that this scene is really long and ultimately not that interesting. One could say the same about this particular Sins video. I don't know what this monitor is and I don't want to know. All I know is that these gangsters in Lao make more than enough money to use tech that doesn't require two dudes to haul a battery-powered TV into a kitchen for a Google Hangouts. Since we nitpick CinemaSins here, I'm going to point out that this TV is not battery powered. You can clearly see the long ass cable underneath the table. I know you have hearing issues, but are you blind too? As you're all aware. Also, there is no camera on this TV and no microphone anywhere on the table or in sight, so I'm kind of curious how he is able to see and hear them. As. What was his name again? Obi. Old Birdman. Named him myself. Right. As Old Birdman told you in the first video, you don't see the camera Lau is using to see the participants in this room, but he very clearly can see and hear them. Wherever that camera system is, it's unimportant for the scene because simply showing that Lau can see and hear them is all that is required for the scene to function. But I will point out that even if they did show the camera, you would have totally missed it anyway considering you didn't even see the power cable on this TV, so stop pretending you care. How soon can you move the money? I already have. How the f*** do you pull that off? Does Lau own all these banks? There's no indication that he does, so how does he go to a mobbed up bank and take out all the cash without the mob knowing about it? You have fundamentally misunderstood this character and why he's in this scene, let alone this movie. And let's not pretend you haven't seen this movie because this is a re and this was like THE comic book movie at the time. Lau specifically states he handled all their investments. What could you possibly have on all of them that we could charge? I'm good with calculation. I handled all the investments. One big pot. Got it. In other words, he was their liaison with these banks and most likely had authority over the accounts considering they are all criminals under surveillance that probably couldn't even open a bank account. Oh, eh, eh, aha. All these gangsters just sit calmly while this guy who stole 68 million from them walks into the kitchen and fake laughs like he owns the place. He even instantly murders one of their henchmen and they still remain calmly seated, awaiting his proposal, which they knew was coming somehow. Note the blatant lie and then the cover-up for that lie. Jeremy says they sit calmly even though Michael Jai White is clearly agitated almost the entire scene and instantly reacts to Joker's entrance. And I thought my jokes were bad. Give me one reason why I shouldn't have my boy here pull your head off. On top of that, Jeremy doesn't understand that these mobsters are all different families. What I mean by that is they all have varying levels of interest in what Joker did to their money. I mean, Maroney clearly expresses disinterest in Joker's heist and is more concerned with the cops tracking their money. Who's stupid enough to steal from us? Two-bit whack job, wears a cheap purple suit and makeup. He's not the problem, he's a nobody. The problem is our money being tracked by the cops. The Chechen wants to hear them out. Sit. I want to hear proposition. And Lau calls 68 million a small amount. As you're all aware, one of our deposits was stolen. A relatively small amount. 68 million. So in fact, the only people that were upset got upset at his appearance and tried to do something about it. It's simple. We uh, kill the Batman. <laughs> if it's so simple, why haven't you done it already? This Maroni jabroni who took over for Falcone would be Tony at CinemaSense. No, I agree. Interjecting to ask a question they were presumably going to answer anyway is exactly like CinemaSins. Enough from the clown! Are we gonna get that long-awaited Spawn versus Joker fight that I've been planning since 1997? Ah, now we understand why Jeremy always asks why Marvel has two characters who are relatively evenly matched fight each other all the time. He thinks Spawn versus Joker would be a compelling fight. I've said it before, but putting a beacon on top of a roof where Batman regularly visits is probably not the best idea, since there are people looking to kill Batman. There are windows everywhere around this roof. The problem with this critique is that it implies people know Batman comes to this roof when the bat signal shines, as opposed to being a beacon that warns criminals of Batman's presence, which is the effect it usually has in almost every Batman property. I grant that there is a possibility of them being seen here, but again, people would have to know Batman physically comes to this location occasionally, and we are shown in this film that he doesn't always show up, and Gordon uses it to scare criminals. I'm hearing that he's doing some good, that criminals are running scared, but I say no. Nah, man. I don't like it tonight. We got more chance of winning the Powerball than running into him. So he hasn't shown up? He often does. I like reminding everybody that he's out there. Why wouldn't he come? Hopefully. Because he's busy. Have you people ever been to Broadway or the New York Ballet? Shows did not just cancel for a week to go yachting in the Caribbean. There are contracts and producers and lawsuits that would happen. This is a cute plot point, but it would literally never happen. It's almost like this isn't Broadway, but Gotham City. 
It's almost like Bruce Wayne is that dude. But also, if Bruce having an orgy with the Russian ballet was such huge news, how did Rachel and Harvey not hear about it until they got to the theater? This movie presumably takes place in 2007 or 2008. That's important because we are shown the technology in the film is relatively similar to that real-life time period, in which case, Twitter wasn't as ubiquitous as it is today, and the iPhone just debuted. Assuming that is the case, and you see headlines were still being displayed on newspapers, I think the answer to your question is pretty self-evident, wouldn't you say? I don't really understand why jumping off a boat full of Russian ballet dancers and swimming over to an airplane is any better an alibi than telling people you're sick and quarantining yourself at Wayne Manor. You are now inviting way more witnesses to tell people of your odd behavior in this case, even if you've paid them handsomely. I heavily disagree with this. Let's say Bruce Wayne was on a short list of suspects that moonlights as the Batman. Of the two options presented here, the one you came up with and the one the film shows, which would cast more suspicion on Bruce? Completely disappearing into his manor because he's sick, or throwing a bombastic and luxurious yacht party with plenty of witnesses where he jumps off the yacht to hop on a rickety plane? Without audience knowledge that Bruce is Batman, any normal person would suspect the Bruce that supposedly locks himself in his manor. With that option, you have no proof he's actually there. The other option is an eccentric billionaire being an eccentric billionaire. You know, like how Elon sells flamethrowers for absolutely no reason. Being an outgoing playboy is the perfect cover. People to this day think R&B singers are soft. You wanna know how I got these scars? Skip! See? CinemaSin skips iconic things. I think, Mr. Fox, a simple phone call might have sufficed. The plan to take Lau out of Hong Kong should have raised all the red flags that Bruce Wayne could be Batman. A mysterious trip to the Caribbean with the Russian ballet, the disappearance off that boat, the CEO of Wayne Enterprises showing up in Hong Kong just before Lau's kidnapped, the weird thing with the cell phones that Lucius does. It wouldn't take long for some people to connect someone with the means to pull this off and land on Bruce. I agree. An audience member would absolutely put those together. What the hell is with you in not understanding that you, a member of the audience, has more information than the characters in the movie? Think about it. Your entire point hinges on the idea that someone investigating Bruce would know he left this yacht party to get on a plane. The only people that would know that are those that were there. This then excludes the ballerinas from knowing about Fox's trip to Hong Kong, eliminating that connective tissue. I mean, in the direct follow-up to that sin, you say they were in the Caribbean and would have to refuel to even reach Hong Kong, which is another barrier to a potential deep dive into Bruce's life. And all of that hinges on someone suspecting Bruce is Batman in the first place, a plot point in this film that is resolved by a guy that almost gets himself killed trying to blackmail bats. You're simply repeating things you see happening on the screen, yet wonder why people, in-universe, don't know what you do. She finds a Joker card in her folder and dismisses it. What the f***? There is a known killer criminal out here known as the Joker, and he is widely known to leave Joker playing cards at the scene of his crimes. This lady judge acts like it's a complete and total accident, doesn't give it a second thought, and has she been watching the news? Again, another instance of Jeremy having information the characters in-universe do not, but still expects them to know. The Joker has not been on the news up to this point in the film. In fact, no one knows he exists yet. Not Dent, not Gordon, and especially this judge. Only the Mafia members seem to have some inkling of who he was, and and even then, Maroney had to tell everyone because most of them didn't even know. Also, what's up with the lady judge quip? You mean opposed to a regular judge? That's sexist. 549 criminals at once. How did you convince Cirillo to hear this farce? This isn't even feasible. Any non-movie judge would have separated these defendants out like a normal court. Thanks for telling us about reality. Would you mind telling us about the film now? For this fake Batman hanging, Joker would have needed to enter a government building with this guy undetected, throw him off the roof, put the rope around his neck so that it would hit this exact window, and then go back through the government building again, undetected, even after the mayor likely would have called for a shutdown of some sort after seeing some f like this. At this point in the film, the mob is working with Joker, and as we will see many times throughout the film, Joker has others, including police officers, doing things for him. What I'm saying is, the Joker most likely didn't do this himself. So these two guys actually work for Joker and are not cops. And that's just for us, the audience, right? These houses are all touching each other. A neighbor is surely going to remember two guys here leading her to her car, right? This is a very convoluted plan. He snuck poison into the commissioner's desk, but he has to hire extras to bomb the judge? That's preposterous. Are you seriously asking why the Joker wouldn't do things efficiently? The Joker? Efficiency? Really? Is it just a coincidence that the one victim of the three that Joker wants to kill personally is currently at Bruce Wayne's penthouse? Because I think it is. It's only a coincidence because you name the circumstances as presented in the film. That's like me saying the majority of the people watching this video are doing so in June. 
I'm simply stating a fact. He's putting it in tomorrow's paper. Goddamn Joker has a printing press, a manufacturing plant that makes custom playing cards, endless henchmen that just spawn when needed. How the hell did he get all this set up when he can barely go five minutes without three subject changes? As he himself later says, he's just a dog chasing cars, man, and yet he's somehow Dr. Manhattan. If you believed that Joker is just a dog chasing cars, his manipulation has worked its magic on you. I've said this for a long time, but never trust what people say, watch what they do. His actions clearly show that he not only does plan things, he's almost omniscient in his ability to predict what will happen and is able to adjust his plans accordingly. But your example of this was an obituary in the newspaper? Come on, dude, I know no one uses newspapers anymore, but you and I are both old enough to remember that anyone could submit obituaries to newspapers back in the day. You're trying to fake out these Zoomers. Let's not shit on the next generation. Let's teach them so they can be better than us. Do you think that your client, one of the wealthiest, most powerful men in the world, is secretly a vigilante who spends his nights beating criminals to a pulp with his bare hands? And your plan is to blackmail this person? Several issues here. Dude never said he thought Bruce Wayne was Batman. He merely provided proof that Batman is using Wayne tech. It's a huge leap for Fox to assume dude suspected Wayne and an even huger shock that it turns out that's actually what he thought. Of course, CinemaSins is the only group of people that believe this man wasn't saying he knew Bruce was Batman. Well, there is a group of morons here on YouTube that probably unironically agree with them, but they're stupid too. Bruce is the head of this company. He literally asks for $10 million a year for the rest of his life. Whose pockets do you think that money will come from? He'll make good on his threat in the obituary column of the Gotham Times to kill the mayor. Wait, he didn't print a fake paper, but instead somehow slipped a fake obituary for the f mayor into the Gotham Times? You realize how many checks and balances are in place to keep people from just slipping their own news articles into the official newspaper of the city? Considering this has happened so many times there's an entire Wikipedia page dedicated to it, it would be nice if you explained those checks and balances that would prevent this in reality and why they didn't work in reality. Look, there are a bunch of cars over here on the left, trucks too, and a massive building that looks like a warehouse. Are you telling me none of them ever wonders why a motorcycle or the f***ing Batmobile, which we saw down here earlier, come racing out of a shipping container? The Tumblr almost certainly uses a different exit than the shipping container, considering it's as wide as your mother. There is also a scene in this film of Bruce and Alfred talking about being inconspicuous during the day, so that means if the Tumblr even used this entrance, it would be at night when no one is here. What do you got on the roof? We're tight, but frankly, there's a lot of windows up here. <laughs> no sh**. This ridiculous laugh. A fight scene in a room with a strobe light and you cut it to death? Why hasn't Nolan been hired by Marvel yet? I don't have much to say about the joke, but I do want to say keep Nolan the hell away from the MCU. It's not just the fact that he doesn't care about the audience being able to hear dialogue these days. It's not even because the action scenes in these movies are kind of lame. It's the fact that he obsesses over grounded realism in a genre that doesn't call for it. If I could levy one criticism against his Batman films, it's that Batman just seems like some dude where the most magical thing about him is his ability to disappear when you turn around. He didn't even give Bane his Venom, which is a bit of irony so large the actor that played Bane went on to play a character named Venom just so the universe could reset. I just don't like directors getting comic book properties and trying to ground them in gritty realism when comic books are not realistic in the first place. Seriously, imagine Nolan handling a Guardians of the Galaxy film with Leo DiCaprio as Star-Lord, Michael Caine as the voice of Groot, and Nowhere shot on location in Chicago. Shit would be terrible. His name's Schiff Thomas. He's a paranoid schizophrenic. Former patient at Arkham. How the f*** does Batman know that? I wasn't able to identify this guy before Harvey took him, and he's been beating Maroney's ass the last half hour. I remember sending this the first time, and there were people who said, Oh, Batman totally knows every single person in Arkham, and I was like, f*** you, where has that been established in the Nolan universe? And then some asshole, a couple of assholes, tried to tell me this guy was f***ing Scarecrow, and he is of course not the f***ing Scarecrow. An earlier scene showed Bruce and Alfred looking up names of potential criminals that were admitted to Arkham in the scene where they cross-referenced the fingerprint on the bullet. That scene lets you know they have a database on the patients being held there, and it's not unbelievable that Bruce, someone who was scouring these files, would have come across this man. I am the Batman. Bruce allows this to happen, knowing full well that the Joker probably wouldn't believe this nonsense. The movie's done an okay job of making it seem like Harvey could be Batman, but we're talking about someone who could put the pieces together to know this is a total lie. While I believe Joker didn't totally fall for this, he says himself that he bought the ruse in the interrogation scene, if only for a little while. Obstruction ahead! Obstruction ahead! Damn it! All units, divert down on the lower fifth! I repeat, exit down! Lower fifth will be like turkeys on Thanksgiving down there. 
it's downright unbelievable that they can't divert this convoy somewhere else or have a backup plan in place and that going below ground is considered the best choice. You can't go around. Are you telling me you'd rather go to an unprotected area than drive on the sidewalk for a little bit to get back on course? There's even a park next to that sidewalk in case you need more room. Note that this is a helicopter shot from the filmmakers with cameras pointed down at the street. The point I'm making is, this is Jeremy using knowledge he has that the characters in-universe don't have. The perspective of the lead vehicle looked like this. Do you think they can see the sidewalk as a viable option when they know they're being hunted by Joker's gang? The convoy leader saw something blocking their path and made an almost instant snap judgment. The entire reason you showed the guy behind the leader saying they'd be like turkeys at Thanksgiving is because you think the leader heard what he said or knows what he knows. And that is, again, only something the audience knows. And Batman didn't show up earlier than this because... He was getting the tumbler out of the shipping container? There's a parallel universe where Batman accidentally kills these kids. Tight. Whatever that universe is isn't this one, and therefore doesn't count as a sin against this one. Go on. You do like to play things pretty close to the chest. I think you mean vest. Again, even though last time it was Bruce saying that to Lucius, and wait, you emphasize do here, as though you had also previously had a conversation with Gordon where he said he was keeping things close to the chest. And that definitely did not happen. What the f*** is with this f***ing line? No, keeping things close to the chest means something, and him saying that is a reference to this conversation that happened earlier in the movie. I've put every known money launderer in Gotham behind bars, but the mob is still getting its money out. I think you and your friend have found the last game in town and you're trying to hit them where it hurts. Their wallets. It's bold. You gonna count me in? Now, this town, the fewer people know something, the safer the operation. Gordon, I don't like that you've got your own special unit. And I don't like that it's full of cops I investigated at Internal Affairs. Well, if I didn't work with cops, she'd investigate it while you were making your name at IA, I'd be working alone. When the chips are down, these, uh, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. Entire point of the movie is how wrong this guy is about this message. And yet, this was 2008. As I looked around today, dude might have a point, yo. We live in a society. Talk me through what's going on with you. Well, Rachel, one of us is about to die, and I'm pretty sure it's me. And either way, we are both tied up next to a bunch of flammable barrels, and this is basically it. This is the end. I can't f***ing believe I let that kid in sixth grade take all my Transformers in exchange for a single valuable beanie baby. That is what's going on with me. Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. Back at the MCU. The Joker's gone. How will they ever do phase five now? Well, they've started off pretty good, I'd say. In fact, I'd give Guardians of the Galaxy an A-, minus. outside of the fact that Adam Warlock should have been the one to defeat Thanos, it was very emotional, had an unintentionally hilarious villain, and was a great send-off to all the characters we love. Are y'all happy now? Will y'all stop asking me for a review I couldn't do because I was moving and now nobody cares about it because it's too late? The Joker plan to be caught. Let's talk about the Joker's plan. Let's not. When I told you that if Gotham no longer needed Batman, we could be together, I meant it. But now I'm sure the day won't come when you no longer need Batman. Moving the goalposts. It's the same goalpost. The deal was for him to stop being Batman. Bruce thought the city needed Batman, but it turns out that he was the one that needed Batman, which means he won't stop being the Batman. I love that Alfred, who knows Bruce's feelings for Rachel, was still going to give this devastating note to Bruce in his current condition until he found out Bruce thought Rachel was going to be with him. Then he takes the note back. Like, this letter's going to crush him regardless. Why did you even think about giving it to him right now? Frankly, the real dick move is letting Bruce think a woman that died loving another man and intended to marry the other man still loved him. That letter was her last words to him, and he robbed Bruce of the opportunity to find closure and move on. Like, it looks nice because Alfred is one of the good guys in the movie, but when you think about it, if this happened to someone in real life and they found out about it, they'd be pissed. This is one of those moments where a line has been crossed. That bandit in the forest in Burma, did you catch him? Yes. How? We burned the forest down. You burned down the forest to stop a guy from stealing? I'll let Joker say exactly what I want to say, only he makes it sound cooler. It's not about money. It's about sending a message. Do you know who picked up Rachel? The real question is, why did anyone pick up Rachel? Where was she being picked up from? Last time we saw her was just before Harvey was put in the armored van, and before that, she was at Bruce's penthouse. There was absolutely no indication that she needed a ride at any point during all this. You're right. She didn't need a ride for this line to make sense, considering pick someone up can be used to mean she got abducted, which is what happened. The only reason you're lumping her in with Dent is because we saw Dent getting into a car, and you're assuming that's what happened with Rachel, which, by your own logic, doesn't make sense. 
Jesus, how did the fire miss burning his left eye? The whole left side of his face was engulfed in flames. How did he protect the eyeball? See? This is a symptom of Nolan trying to realistically adapt a comic book story when his explanation doesn't make sense anyway. The real origin of Dent's two-faced persona was acid thrown at his face, which would work in a realistic setting, and you don't have silly issues like this. Dent didn't lose his mind until Joker removes the face mask. That's the Wilson already obviously Joker in a face mask. Dent is very clearly a gentleman. What I'm saying is, some of these women's makeup jobs ain't too far off. Like this hooligan that looks like she's wearing a Rorschach mask. Also, why are you asking Ramirez to do anything? You saw her name implicated on the text from Alfred. Guess we've got to thank good old Berg for that sh don't we? Once Berg was taken care of, nobody else could possibly be compromised, I guess. The context of that text was cops who have family in the hospital. At this point in the film, the hospital was blown up, so there was no reason for Gordon to suspect her anymore. She didn't attempt to kill Reese. Then, somehow Joker kidnaps Engel and sets up this live broadcast, which means Joker took this bus and somehow found Engel, who we last saw on the street filming Gordon and the lawyer's escape, in the last five minutes or so. And this is definitely Joker behind the camera, as he can't help make an appearance by the end of this video. You're presenting this as if these events are happening immediately after one another, when the scene you're talking over is of Gordon's arrival at the demolished hospital. Even if you factored in him being a cop able to use his siren to get there faster, they show you this area has been cordoned off already, and the fire that engulfed the hospital has been extinguished. This means some time has passed, and since Joker has henchmen working for him, this isn't as unbelievable as you'd have us believe. Mr. Fox, security is showing a break-in at the R&D department. Why didn't Batman just call Lucius and tell him that he was going to be down at the R&D department, rather than triggering some sort of security breach that he would have to come investigate? Wouldn't the building security be prompted to investigate this? Considering the nature of this particular R&D department, there's no f way Fox or Bruce would allow access to security, which is why Fox was the first one notified. And Bruce needed to do this in secret, especially with how Fox reacted to what he was doing there. He almost quit over it. I'm Team Lucius here. Batman is a detective. Find the Joker. You don't need the sh and it is very stupidly illegal and wrong. Everything Batman does is stupidly illegal and wrong. He's a vigilante that dresses up like a bat for f**k's sake. Nothing about this makes any sense, and we only accept it because we have suspended our disbelief. Wait, Joker is reading from a script? I thought he doesn't plan. There was a whole speech about it. He still doesn't get it, guys. Where's my family? Where my family died. Well, you and Rachel were dating. You asked her to marry you, but she was kind of dragging her feet on answering, so you guys weren't family at all. If friends are family, so are girlfriends, dude. Just ask Dominic Toretto. I didn't know there were any rules. Oh, who could have predicted that dogs would be a factor in this movie after Batman explicitly noted that dogs were the weakness to the new Batman armor? Why couldn't this asshole have built some web fluid to come out of his wrist to trap dogs if he encountered them? I don't know if you realize, but these are the same dogs that prompted him to worry about them in the first place. Oh, who am I kidding? Of course you don't realize. I think we removed a sin for Tiny Lister's character throwing the detonator away last time we did this, so we shall end this one as well. You absolutely did not. I have no idea how Batman's wrist projectiles work, but I find it hilarious how they aren't in this shot, but in a few seconds, Batman's got the whole battering bonanza exposed. His other arm is trapped behind the bar, so how did he press the proper buttons? He read the instructions. Harvey being this mad at Gordon makes zero f***ing sense. It was Gordon's men that betrayed Dent and Rachel. Everyone else he's gone after had direct impact on the death of Rachel, but not Gordon. He said that thing earlier about thinking Gordon's people were crooked back in the day. Is that the extent of this grudge? Yes, you are answering yourself. Ramirez was directly responsible for Rachel's death, and Gordon fought Dent tooth and nail vouching for her. He told her she was dirty like 13 times. I'd be pissed at him too. You don't want to hurt the boy, Harvey. God damn it, Batman. If you showed up all stealthy like this, why didn't you just sneak up, grab the gun, save the kid, and incapacitate Harvey already? We know you have the capability to do that. Because the point is to talk Harvey out of the mind frame he's currently in. Let's say Batman knocks him out. Then what? They arrest him? That defeats the entire purpose of using Dent as the White Knight of Gotham, ruining everything he stood for, which has the unfortunate side effect of undermining the cases he worked on. They say that in the movie, and is the reason Batman takes the fall for Harvey's crimes. Five dead, two of them cops. Two-Face killed the cop, Wurtz, one of Maroni's henchmen, Maroni and Maroni's driver, and then he punched Ramirez. So I don't know where you're coming up with this five figure or two cops unless Ramirez died from that punch after the coin toss saved her life. You are assuming the movie is saying Gordon is right. Ramirez is missing, and Gordon is assuming she's dead. Again, stop expecting characters to be or act perfectly. Just because he said the line doesn't make him correct. I mean, he trusted that bitch even after she got Rachel killed. He's been wrong about her specifically all movie. I killed those people. 
That's what I can be. Aren't people gonna wonder why you killed those people and didn't kill one person in that building with Joker tonight? You don't have to be a professional detective to know that makes no sense. Why can't those just be unsolved murders or gang related or whatever? Why the f does Batman need to take the blame for this if no one could prove Harvey did it? Because saying Batman did it gives them something to chase so that investigators don't look at Harvey's victims too closely. It's Misdirection 101. They teach you this at Magician Tech. I don't know how you missed it. It was right next door to Clown University where you graduated summa cum laude. His actions clearly show that he not only does plan things, he's almost omniscient in his ability to predict what will happen and is able to adjust his plan. This happens a lot. A lot. <clears throat> his actions clearly show that he not only does plan things, he's almost omniscient in his ability to, to predict what will happen. Considering this happened so many times, there's an entire Wikipedia page de- eh. Considering this has happened so many times, there's an entire Wikipedia page dedicated to it, it would be nice if you explained those checks and balances and that- The tumbler almost certainly uses a different exit than the shipping container, considering it's as wide as your mother. Uh, there- <laughs> Alright, look, I wrote this script a while ago, and um... Sometimes the jokes, they, they hit me out of nowhere. The tumbler almost certainly uses a different exit than the shipping container, considering it's as wide as your mother. There is also a scene in this film of Bruce and Alfred take... There is also a scene in this film of Bruce and Alfred talking about how... <laughs> Frankly, the real dick move is letting Bruce think a woman that died loving another man is an... Frankly, the... Okay. Frankly, the... Frankly, the real dick move is letting Bruce think a woman that died loving another man and intended to marry that a <sighs> Frankly, the <sighs> Jesus Christ, this is so hard. Ugh, I hate this shit. Dent is very clearly a gentleman. What I'm saying is, some of these women's makeup jobs ain't too far off. Like this hooligan. Like this hooligan that looks like she's wearing a Rorschach mask. <laughs> I struggled to get through that line because that was... I, I, I was reading it before I got to it, and it was cracking me up, so. <laughs> like I said, I, I write these way in advance, and um, I, I forget what I have written. So when I'm, I get to the, to the actual voiceover part, it just sometimes fucks me up. This is one of those times. The context of that text, the context of that text, the context of that text was cops who have family in the hospital, in the hospital. I don't like the. Considering the nature of this particular R&D department, there's no fucking way Fox or Bruce would allow se access to security. It's Misdirection 101. They teach you... <laughs> the line here is funny, okay. <laughs> Alright. Right. <sighs> ah, fuck, I hate this. Because saying Batman did it gives them something to chase so that investigators don't look at Harvey's victims too closely. It's Misdirection 101. They teach you this at Magician Tech. I don't know how you missed it. It was right next door to Clown University where you graduated summa cum laude. And that's it. I'm done.